what I would like to do today is to try to convince you that a molecule of which we all live with has also a kind of a toxic potential and how cells can deal with that. So what you see here is on the other hand my dog on an altitude of 3,500 meters. So he's breathing a little bit strangely because the oxygen pressure is lower. While here the neighbor female is in heat so he's in under extremely stress. So in both situations you have a problem with oxygen, here you don't have enough and here you start to produce oxygen radicals. Now, uh, <clears throat> factors that can counteract the chemical stability of DNA are many. UV light, ionizing radiation, smoking, air pollution, inflammation, as well as metabolism. So before I start with our data, I'd like to introduce you a little bit into this field. So if one goes back to the original papers, for instance, by Tom Lindahl, we know that hydrolysis, oxidation, and non-enzymatic methylation are the three main uh, uh, factors that counteract on DNA. And one must not think that this is a very unfrequent event. You see, we have a capacity for every cell every day to repair about uh, 20,000 depurination or as in our case oxidation we have 1,000 to 2,000 in, in certain cells, cancer cells up to 100,000 alterations of G's because the base G has the lowest redox potential of all four bases in the DNA and therefore oxidation by uh, radicals is very frequent. Now, this is kind of a textbook uh, slide I show to the students usually. We have kind of an oxidamage damage fountain. We have a capacity to deal with a certain amount of G. However, if that is overflowing, we have three possibilities, apoptosis, cancer, and DNA repair, and this is what I would like to show you today, how we think that the cell manages to repair thousands of atox or G in every cell every day. Now, who are the sources of this uh, uh, ROS, which we of course by food and many things try to minimize with antioxidants. So we have these radicals, radical oxygen species and non-radical oxygen species occurring in many situations, uh, either on an exogenous factors, radiation, UV, alcohol, smoking, toxins, psychological problems, pharmaceutical nutrition, overweight stress. So, I mean, these are uh, the causes for I think a majority of diseases that we face in the Western society. On the other hand, you produce about half of your body weight, ATP, every day through oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria. And the final step there, this control uh, mechanism needs oxygen and we have some oxygen radicals occurring from time to time and therefore from the mitochondrial uh, part we also face. And ROS have been described with all these diseases. Aging to, is not a disease but is a problem for many people of course. Tumor genesis, cancer, diabetes, cataract, atherosclerosis, Alzheimer and Parkinson. Now again this is a number I would like that you keep in mind at least for this seminar and this in cells uh, which, ha which ha have, uh, tr are transformed, this number increases and this has to do mainly to the fact that the cells cannot control these events properly. And I'll give you some data in the second half of my talk uh, trying to show you how these things are regulated. Now we have examples in nature where animals use very low oxygen this is a sponge which uh, lives in the Arctic Sea. 
is supposed to be 10,000 years old. So I think oxidation use has, is one reason why our life is limited and animals such as that one also Galapagos turtles who are 150 years old, they have a very low oxygen consumption. Okay, now this is enough for a general introduction. Now I come to uh, DNA repair and we, have, uh, we are talking today about basic scission repair, which is the most important uh, repair pathway because most genes involved in this pathway are essential. This is a little bit different from the clinical issues of xeroderma pigmentosum nucleotide excision repair, where people can live if they have mutated genes. Okay, now damage recognition. So I think it's an, an, a, a huge task to recognize the 20 to 30,000 damages every day in every cell. So there must be a huge machinery. And if you don't recognize a mistake, you can also not repair it. It's like a dentist is worthless if he doesn't find your hole in your teeth. Okay, then these enzymes, they are called glycosylases. They re recognize the damage and together with an, uh, they remove then the base. They flip the base out and cut it. And then the, there is a hole and this hole is recognized by uh, AP endonuclease 1, which then uh, makes the basis for the repair machinery, DNA polymerase beta, XRCC1 like S3 to repair. Uh, that can be done either short patch one nucleotide or these, ends, these polymerases or beta, for instance, have strand displacement activity. They displace the strand and then they process it to finally get the DNA again as it should be. Now, since this is so frequent, it's not astonishing that the cellular machinery also bo borrowed the replication machinery of the lagging strand, which are uh, polymerase delta, epsilon, pCNA, and uh, FEN1, ligase 1, to, to, uh, to display strand up to 10 basis which then can be finally cut by FEN1 and again sealed. And it's not known what, uh, why we have two uh, basic excision repair pathways. People think this is the main one and this is a backup mechanism. And as you will see later in my talk, probably it's a switch between those two depending on the issue the cell has to deal with. Okay. Classical situation. You have a damage, the damage is removed, and the machinery uses the proper strand to incorporate the base. Now, with oxidation damage, the situation is different, extremely different, and that's why here uh, we had this idea which we think is at least fee uh, reasonable. So we have a GC, then we have oxidative stress, so we have an 8 oxo G here and a C. Okay, now if the cell is not dividing or still in the G2 phase, we have a DNA glycosylase called OGG1, 8 oxo G DNA glycosylase, which can remove this 8 oxo G, and then this classical pathway I just showed you before comes in and incorporates the correct C. Okay, so far so good. When we now replicate, and I'll show you data, and it is also known from the literature, faithful polymerases which have an active, tight active site, they mostly incorporate an A, A opposite A-toxo G, making a so-called Huxtein base pair, which of course if not repaired, gives you a GC to a TA transversion mutation. Okay, now cell nature has invented something, namely another DNA glycosylase called MUTE-YH. And this glycosylase can be removed the correct base if base paired with a Huxtein base pair with an 8-oxo-G. 
now if we have again a polymerase who is using now the damaged strand to repair, we have the same situation. This is the problem. We have an error-prone bypass during replication. We have an error-prone bypass during repair. So that cannot be the solution. The consequences are these mutations. And to solve this problem, we postulate a post-replicative system with an error-free DNA polymerase. And this is where our work comes in here. That these mutations are not something which are very, uh, very uh, unfrequent. was shown by a, a, a big clinical paper by the Stratton Group in Nature a couple of years ago where they found that in breast, lung, gastric, colorectal, renal, ovarian cancer, which are very frequent, many uh, protein, they tested here 700 kinases, mutations in kinase genes, and found in those cancers that uh, GC, <coughs> excuse me, GC to TA transversion mutations were very frequent, among others, of course. Okay. Now, uh, DNA polymerases are, of course, the working horses to synthesize DNA. And uh, in the last 50 years, especially due to genetics and the Human Genome Project, we have about 15 different DNA polymerases that were discovered since the first discovery of an E. coli polymerase by Arthur Kornberg 53 years, four years ago now. Polymerases uh, occur in multiple forms. So this is, we have one polymerase in a virus. Even in certain viruses, we have two. Five in E. coli, in bacteria. About eight uh, in, in, uh, in cerevisia, eukaryotes. Ten in plants and 15 in mammalian cells. I don't want to bother you what they all do. They belong to different families, A, B, X and Y, and maybe even reverse transcriptase, if you also count the telomerase as a DNA polymerase. They are either uh, multi-subunit complexes, or in the case of these translation polymerases, they are more single polypeptide. Now, of course, you can now say what they are doing, and so on. So we, con we concentrate to today on one protein, <coughs> with which I collaborate in many years with Giovanni Marca from Pavia. It's called polymerase lambda, which people think has a role in basic scission repair. Now coming back to the atox or G problem, which I did, still didn't tell you before. The problem is when you have an atox or G and the replication machinery goes, it doesn't stop. It goes over it and frequency incorporates an A. And this A, Opposite the natoxo G is not recognized by the proofreading machinery. The accurate polymerases at the replication fork have a second activity, being a 3 to 5 exonuclease, which can remove mismatches which are incorporated by polymerases. However, this situation is only poorly or not recognized, and also the post replicative mismatch repair system is very inactive here. So we really have this mutation danger. Okay, now let's introduce you a little bit to the working horse and that I'm talking about today is DNA polymer lambda is a small polymerase, about 65 kilodalton. It has different activities. It's a polymerase, also a template independent polymerase, terminal transferase, polynucleotide synthase and the DRP lyase. And it is involved in three different the repair pathways, basic scission repair in the physiological type of uh, making mistakes or introducing chain and in non-homologous, uh, excuse me, non-homologous end joining, which is the, the least accurate uh, double strand break repair mechanism as well as you will see in translation synthesis. Mice are normal. Most translation polymerases do not give a phenotype. So these things are extremely redundant. 
However, immunoglobulin recombination is affected and cells, pol lambda minus cells, have a sensitivity to oxidative stress. And this was actually the reason why we started this work. Oxidative stress, sensitivity. Need to introduce you a couple of other proteins in order to understand the data later on. One is a single strand binding protein, RPA, which is not only a function in the three R's, replication, repair, recombination, so it's also uh, an, an inducer protein of checkpoint control. Then PCNA, which is a ring line protein, it's a very promiscuous protein. It can interact with more than 130 protein, and this interaction is most likely regulated through post-translational modifications such as phosphorylation, ubiquitination, simulation, and so on. Okay. Now again, the problem here. When we have this Huxtein base pair in a situation where a very active, tightly active uh, site in a DNA polymerase which closes it, makes an induced fit upon the proper incorporation, then it's not possible that this syn conformation can change. However, translation polymerases, and we knew the structure of pol lambda at that time, they have a more open active site where even two nucleotides can go in, so, and they do not close upon binding of nucleotides. So the idea was, and we didn't know that at the time, we know more now, is that an ADOX or G may go into the anti-conformation and therefore could base pair with a C. Okay. Now the, the last protein I'm going to show you is MUTYH. And MUTYH is a protein which can remove a proper base, A, if base pair to ADOX or G. And that this is an essential important protein has been shown that if patients suffering from uh, colon cancer have mutations in these proteins at uh, these hotspots shown here. Okay, it's mainly colorectal adenomas and carcinomas those patients suffer from. Okay, now we have now tested then systematically the many polymerases under these conditions and looked for conditions in vivo, how these polymerases can handle this ADOX or G. Okay, now show you the assay. It's, it's a very simple one, primary extension assay, where you have here a red is a G, and the underlying sequence corresponds to codon 10 to 14 of the human RAS gene, which is G-rich and often mutated in uh, uh, bladder carcinomas. Now, a couple of experiments. This is simply how a DNA polymerase works. You see, we have here two Gs to start with. And if we add in a normal template, if we add an A, C, G, or T, we have only two C incorporated bona fide DNA polymerase. Everything is okay. Or you add all four, then you get full length synthesis. However, when we have an ADOX or G, and this was simply the control to see whether we have the right substrate here, is that when we uh, uh, now an ADOX or G, we have an A incorporation, you see, A or 2C, or even more, this is slippage, I can't discuss that. So we have A and C incorporation, okay? And of course, again, full synthesis. So we know already this is a translation polymerase. It can over it and can see. <coughs> what we then have noticed, and this might be very important as a kind of a important enzyme working in this issue, is the extremely low Km for this reaction. The, the Km is almost 1,000 times lower than when you do PCR, for instance, with DNA polymerase. So it's in the nanomolar range, not in the micro. So you see, we can get an A and a C incorporation. Now, one more experiment before I quantify everything. You see, when we now add additional proteins, PCNA and RPA, 
we completely repress here more than 99% A incorporation in the presence of those two proteins, while C incorporation is not affected. So there's a bias now with, together with the polymerase and these auxiliary proteins to not incorporate the wrong A and to better incorporate the correct C. And then we can quantify this with many polymerases, replicative enzyme, other repair enzyme, Translation polymerase, so this Poletta, this is the XPV polymerase, Poliota, Lambda, we see that only in one case we get a 1200 to 1 bias of the correct C versus A incorporation. So the incorporation, and I think that was new here, that it's not the polymerase per se, it's the Pol Lambda in the presence of these auxiliary proteins and of course be nice we have some indirect evidence that here there is a confirmation and information about the polymerase in the presence of these two proteins. Second backup enzyme is likely Paul Eta with also a very faithful incorporation that was boosted by the two proteins here. Now when we we did primer extension so that is not case. In the next uh, experiments here, we used now a NIC. We took a template and put an ADOXOG, which was then giving a gap and say, what is required to, to, uh, to, uh, to replicate this, uh, this NIC properly. And again, take home message from this paper here was the polymerase lambda again in the presence of RPA and PCNA incorporates 750 fold more C than A and that is why this paper I think is interesting repressed other repair polymerases under this condition so you can add then uh, polymerase beta another repair enzyme and those two proteins repress this protein while increase the faithful incorporation of polymerase lambda. Okay, now knowing this, uh, this is again oxidant starvation when my student Barbara Vanlon on our mountain trip had to prepare her, her uh, Tent. She had to blow things up. Okay, suffering again from oxygen, but then she, she devised uh, what we call an, an uh, assay to, together with uh, collaboration with the Dianov group in Oxford, in which she constructed <coughs> an ATOXO GA versus a GC template, which then is a uh, uh, binds to streptavidine beads, we can then incorporate, cross-link and wash again and then look on STS page what kind of protein bind now to such a situation and we see then here this is the ATOXO GA template, a GC template that mute by H binds, PCNA, DNA like S1, DNA like S3 polymerase lambda, not polymerase beta, as I showed you before. Uh, so most of this protein, which people think, they bind to such a substrate. Therefore, uh, and, and second, uh, Barbara showed that upon H2O2 treatment, those two proteins are very heavily upregulated. See, this is H2O2 and this is the control. Okay, so what she then uh, took in the next round, she did, they, uh, established an assay to measure first replication and then repair. And uh, she did this by constructing templates in which she could incorporate radioactive DATP versus radioactive DCTP and the radioactivity on a sequencing cell is a direct measure of incorporation of the incorrect versus correct nucleotide. So 
So the signal of person is coming directly from either A or C. And with this assay, then uh, Barbara, okay, I have to go. Barbara then reconstituted the entire system. I show you a few data only because that has also been published. Now, when we now take uh, uh, make a synthesis with the replicative machinery, Paul Delta, PC and ARFC, we see that we get preferential A incorporation. So this is a titration of the polymerase. We get A incorporation and much less C, as we would expect from, from a, a faithful replication machine. It, comp it incorporates preferentially A. And this substrate was then taken subsequently by Barbara to digest it with mutyh. And you can clearly see, you have to compare now uh, these lanes to those. Those lanes are not digestible by mutyh because they, here you have C incorporation, while those lanes <coughs> which correspond to this one can be digested upon titration of mutyh. So the, pro the, the wrong product made by the replication machinery can now be uh, cut by mutyh and then she then uh, finally characterized each step and I'll show you a few results. First of all, PCN and RPA specifically allow DNA pol lambda to correctly incorporate the DCTP. So here this is simply a quantification. You again see that this now replicated digested DNA is the same type of substrate we sh I showed you in the previous uh, papers. And we again see that the pol lambda preferentially incorporate a C versus pol beta. Now, the problem now is about ligation. Here the situation was very complicated. I'll give you simply the take-home message. We can discuss, of course, details anytime. When we have a preferential, a wrong A incorporated, then it is the short patch ligation machinery, ligase 3, XRCC1, which uh, ligates it. So I think both situations are ligated. That's why probably we have mutations. In the case of ligase 3 short patch. However, we realized under certain conditions that, that uh, that we need an additional protein called FEN1, suggesting that we have strand displacement. So the enzyme goes in, displaces the strand, and FEN1 is a structure-specific endonuclease which cuts single-stranded flaps. And, and uh, it can stimulate strand displacement activity when both A or C incorporate. Okay, now when we do that a little bit more careful and then finally seal this situation, we can see that now the ligase 1, so the lagging type enzymatic machinery is used. Then it preferentially ligates situation where you have a correct C incorporation. So it's probably a switch between two repair mechanisms depending on the, on the faithful or unfaithful incorporation, and I th this is now a project on which we try to find out what's going on. So finally then Barbara did some in vivo experiments. They, upon H2O2 treatment, we have here uh, A-DOX-OG localization with mute by H, as well as A-DOX-OG localization with DNA polymerase lambda. So this first part, would then finish by saying replicative pole delta preferentially incorporate a wrong A. <coughs> mute by H can cut this. Mute by H, I didn't show you this, can interact with the polymerase lambda. They specifically allow the enzymes to correctly incorporate the C. And the short patch ligase 3 preferentially ligates wrong 
miss uh, uh, excuse me, like as one in the presence of flat band on nuclear, as one like as preferentially the correct products, and finally they are mute by age like as one and three pol lambda of n one piece and are specifically recruited. This is the initial experiment I showed you to A toxo G A, but not to control template. They both colocalized on damaged sites. Now, how is this now connected to replication and repair? So there must be a mechanism that we, we know, that the cells know when to correct this. And this is, as you all know, one sometimes has difficulties with referees because you find things which are not obvious to them. And here, this was an uh, initial work uh, done by Isabel Frua in my lab. What she did, that was six years ago now, doing a small proteomic approach, looking to which proteins pull on the bind. And among many others, she identified CDK2 cyclin A. And people, then we characterized that a little bit and then said, so what, what should a repair protein do in replication? Now I try to convince you that here we have an easy way that the cell might use. Okay, now, when you look into repair protein, we come more and more into the field of post-translational modification. So all proteins I was talking to you about, they are phosphorylated or acetylated, simulated, ubiquitinated. And this is our contribution here. We found, Isabel found that, that uh, polymerase lambda is phosphorylated through the cell cycle and then later Ursula Wimmer ubiquitination and this kind of gives us now some hope that we can, excuse me, find out what's going on. So Paul Lambda interacts in vitro and in vivo with CDK2 and it can be phosphorylated in vitro and this phosphorylation level is modulated during the cell cycle. So we assume that there is an effect on Paul Lambda in the cell cycle. Of course, the hypothesis here is very clear. Maybe during replication or shortly after replication, this repair event is there to remove those frequently incorporated A opposite A toxo G. Now Ursula then for a year was frustrating around by testing a few things, what phosphorylation did. And what she found out fi finally was that when a protein cannot be phosphorylated, it has a different stability. And this is shown here. We then, she then identified the different uh, phosphorylation sites, and the most important one is the threonine 553A, which, if mutated and not phosphorylatable, is very low here in a 293T cells. Also in osteosarcoma cells, it's reduced, and we can play around with pol lambda minus cells by adding the wild type versus the mutated vector and you see again message is okay as seen here by RT-PCR but the protein is low. So uh, that's simply a control experiment those both polymerases are active you could argue the protein is not properly folded and therefore uh, degraded in the cell. Now, when we then treated the cells with cyclohexime, the protein synthesis inhibitor, we can clearly see again that the protein is very unstable. And we can partly rescue the stability upon adding inhibitors of the proteasome, the proteasome degradation machinery. We can partly rescue uh, the protein. Now, this smells, of course, of ubiquitination. And this is the experiment showing this, that the non-phosphorylatable and non-phosphorylated protein is heavily ubiquitinated. 
while the wild type is very low or probably only monoubiquitin. So I think phosphorylation, which is automatically done by the cell cycle machinery during cell cycle, prevents pol lambda from degradation, thus likely being active as this repair protein I tried to convince you in the first part of my talk. Now then when phosphorylation stabilizes the enzyme during late S and G2 phase of the cell cycle, so that was of course for us a nice experiment to show that in late S and G2 phases where really the cell should have a closer look to the integrity of the genome, that this repair pathway, probably through this polymerase mutual H pol lambda mechanism, would then have time and the enzyme is stabilized to do this experiment. This, uh, this is, by the way, this threonine is very conserved uh, in, in, a, in evolution from zebrafish to human. So I think it's an important issue here. Now, this is when we then started the collaboration with uh, Gregory Dianov and Elena Ferrari, my technician, went then to the lab to purify an activity which can ubiquitinate pol lambda, and this is simply shown here. Just to remind you, you need E1, E2, and E3 enzymes to do it. The, here, this is simply to show you that we have three different E2s we need, H5B, H5C, and H7. And then when we isolate this protein, did mass spec this was this enzyme is called uh, mule E3 ligase, which we then characterized a little bit better. We then did knockdown of mu ligase leads to an increase in DNA polymerase lambda protein levels. So you see this is siRNA, and then we have an increase of about fifty percent of pol lambda. I'd like to mention here that we, we cannot expect here 100 times upregulation because these fine tunings and Grigory Dianov has some data on Paul Beta showing that all polymerases which are not engaged at the chromatin are immediately marked and degraded. In 30% of all tumors you have misregulated DNA polymerases, especially those translation polymerases, which per se are not accurate, they must not work everywhere, but only where they have to, for instance, here at this region. Okay, then, uh, the, as a next experiment, we took, we knocked down ARF. ARF is an inhibitor of mule, so this mule E3 ligase cannot always be active, otherwise it would digest all the time. So it's inactivated by ARF, which goes away from mule upon genotoxic stress. So when a cell comes under genotoxic stress, ARF is removed and mule active. So you see if we knock down ARF, we have a decrease in pol lambda, which makes sense, because then mule is active and can <coughs> degrade pol lambda. When we then next uh, treat cells with H2O2, we can clearly see that upon H2O2 treatment, we have a decrease in mule and an increase in pol lambda. Okay, so let's uh, leave it at this and conclude here. <coughs> Polymerase lambda in the presence of PCNA and RPA faithfully bypass 8 oxo-G lesions. Phosphorylated at 5,5,3 by CDK cycling A and D in a cell cycle dependent manner. When this threonine is mutated, pol lambda is degraded by the proteasome. The three E2 enzymes together with mule E3 ligase play a role in ubiquitination. Knockdown of mule leads to an increase in the polymerase levels. A knockdown of the mule inhibitor ARF results in a decrease protein levels and 
upon H2O2 treatment, polanda level increase while levels of mu decrease. So polanda is a strong candidate among the 15 mammalian DNA polymerases to faithfully act as a translation synthesis polymerase over ADOXOG. And we just have in the last few weeks an interesting result, namely that patients suffering from severe mental retardation, people found a mutation in mule. And some first results now indicate that this mutated mule is hip hyperactive. Usually people look for a, a decrease in inactive, is hyperactive meaning that probably a hyperactive mule would downregulate pole lambda, thus hampering the repair system. So these patients probably have a not optimally working DNA repair system in oxidative damage. Now let me finish with what we think is the model. The model is that you have oxidation frequently and you have replication going on and you have frequent A incorporation. We cannot prevent this. But then MUTYH would take the A out and we have the ADOXOG to be repaired. So we now have either an error-free uh, pathway here by polymerase lambda, FEN1, ligase 1, this long patch basic here. On the other hand, we have an error-prone loop, and if you go back to these numbers in this initial paper I showed you, when we have a 3 to 1 uh, priority of Paul beta incorporation C versus A, we have 75% correct incorporation, and if you would go 10 times along this loop, this kind of futile cycle, in cells which have enough time before they go into uh, mitosis or in post-replicative tissues, you might get away with it by this error-prone loop. And this is, might be the reason why Paul Lambda cells are surviving, but with some more stress upon H2O2 treatment. Finally, I'd like to thank the people who did the work here which was uh, very recently done, Barbara Van Loon, Elena Fanari, and Elie Markanen, as well as a collaboration with Grigori Dianov's group, Giovanni Maga and Giuseppe Villani, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>